Hello, and thank you for joining our session, Digital Monograph Publication, Rethinking Relationships and Collaborative Models. My name is Sarah McKee, the Senior Associate Director for Publishing at Emory University, and I'm joined today by colleagues Crystal Bruch, Designer for Online Publications at Brown University, Darcy Collins, Assistant Director, Acquisitions at the University of British Columbia Press, Susan Dorr, Associate Director at the University of Minnesota Press, Beth Fugit, Grants and Digital Projects at the University of Washington Press, and Allison Levy, Digital Scholarship Editor at Brown University. Our session today will focus on three newly published or forthcoming interactive digital monographs. You'll hear about the collaborations that brought these works into being and why the authors and publishers were committed to digital publication. It might be helpful first to understand that while we're all based at different institutions, our individual initiatives are part of a larger project launched in 2014 by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to fund explorations of long-form digital publishing in the humanities. So today we're eager to share not only the final products of these explorations in the form of three groundbreaking digital books, but also the questions and answers and challenges that arose from and guided those explorations. The session is dedicated to thinking through what we're learning individually and collectively from producing these kinds of works. Here we go. In my role at Emory University, I'm based not at a publisher, but at the Fox Center for Humanistic Inquiry, the central locus for humanities endeavors on campus. There, I run the Digital Publishing in the Humanities Initiative, which supports faculty authors in their early efforts to develop open access monographs, often well in advance of signing a publishing contract with a scholarly press. But we also collaborate very closely with other campus units, including the Emory Center for Digital Scholarship, the Emory Library Scholarly Communications Office, and the Center for Faculty Development and Excellence, which is supported by the Office of the Provost. At Emory, we've identified three main pathways for authors looking to publish an open access digital monograph. The first is a conventional book that is distributed as an open access publication, typically as a PDF or an EPUB. A second path allows for the integration of a conventional text-based argument with digital en enhancements and resources. The third path for an interactive book that behaves in many ways like a website is by far the most challenging. Uh, and the projects you see today will exemplify those kinds of monographs that are emerging from the second and third pathways. Um, but while we have clearly identified these nice, neat pathways, uh, the diagram doesn't reflect the workflows and challenges behind the books. Um, the panelists today are all approaching those challenges in different ways. The Digital Publications Initiative at Brown University, headed by Allison Levy, is a sister project of the Emory Initiative in that we both focus on working with authors to develop digital monographs that will ultimately be published elsewhere. So Brown focuses primarily on developing books that follow that third or interactive pathway, and panelists Allen and Crystal Bruch will share the story of the initiative's first completed book, Furnace and Fuse, published with the University of Virginia Press. Brown and Emory are also experimenting with the Manifold platform. And today you will hear from Susan Dorr, one of the co-founders and developers of Manifold, a digital book platform built at the University of Minnesota Press with careful attention to the needs of both authors and publishers. Developing a digital monograph often takes a very long time, um, but authors can begin using Manifold in the earliest stages of research to share their findings and build community. One of our authors at Emory, Kylie Smith, is currently using Manifold in just this way, as she works on the manuscript for her book, Jim Crow in the Asylum, which is under advanced contract with the University of North Carolina Press. Manifold also allows for a seamless integration of conventional text with digital resources, and Susan will showcase all of this robust functionality through the work in progress, cut, copy, paste. Manifold also offers a collections function, which allows a publisher to gather multiple books together into a library of related works. The University of Minnesota Press has recently assembled the Reading for Racial Justice collection, making freely available 32 and counting of its books that respond to our current moment of racial reckoning. 
thinking about how a digital publishing platform might intrinsically support an author or publisher's commitment to social justice is at the very heart of the Raven Space Project, an initiative led by the University of British Columbia Press uh, with partners including the University of Washington Press. Raven Space was developed to address issues specific to publishing interactive digital works by and for indigenous communities and scholars. Founder and principal investigator Darcy Cullen will share with you the features of and values behind Raven Space, which are exemplified in As I Remember It, the first book to be published on the platform. We hope you'll stay tuned after the session um, for a discussion moderated by Beth Fugit. But for now, I will turn the floor over to Susan Dorr. So hi everyone, my name is Susan Dorr and I'm the Associate Director of the University of Minnesota Press. Uh, since 2015, I've managed a team creating a web-based publishing and reading platform called Manifold. Manifold offers a user-friendly and scalable way to add publishing to the web to our book production workflow as scholarly publishers. You can view the University of Minnesota Press installation of Manifold at manifold.umn.edu and I'll show that to you in just a moment. I want to note that Manifold is open source software and you can find our project on GitHub at Manifold Scholar if you would like to learn more. So Manifold is developed by scholars and publishers for scholars and publishers. It is a collaboration between the University of Minnesota Press, Professor Matt Gold and his team at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York, and the develop, development agency Cast Iron Coding. It has been funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and our current grant is focused on establishing Manifold Digital Services as a sustainable division placed within the University of Minnesota Press. The secret ingredient to the success of Manifold is the shared responsibility and collaboration between our three organizations with our different points of view. Minnesota CUNY and Cast Iron are a university press expert at preparing, publishing, and promoting scholarship, a digital humanities center focused on teaching and learning, and a digital development agency as a software developer helping us understand the implications of the things we say we want and need and helping us to plan our development that looks to future needs and use cases. Today I'll show you three uses of Manifold, uh, a work in progress, Cut, Copy, Paste by Whitney Tredian, a glimpse of our reading group functionality, and a glimpse of access controls that we have recently enabled, initially for uses in courses that needed to be private, but also adaptable to sell access to publication. It's also worth noting that Manifold is used by more than 30 publishers today, and they have many other use cases than what you'll see today, and we would encourage you to check out their installations as they might be relevant to your own publishing needs. What I'm showing you here is a collection of projects in process that's on the Manifold instance um, at the University of Minnesota Press. And I'm going to switch over right now to the Manifold site for the U of M Press to show you a little bit more in a live mode. What you're seeing here is the homepage for University of Minnesota Press instance of Manifold. And as you scroll down, you'll see that reading for racial justice collection that Sarah mentioned. But we get to um, some new releases and now to our projects in progress. And I'll click through to Whitney's project. Manifold can publish final versions of record, but it can also be used for uh, projects to develop over time live on the site. The six projects in that project collection of works in progress are both single authored monographs and multi authored collections. The scholars work with the digital projects editor at Minnesota to add media and draft text as they are created, revealing to readers the evolution of a project in real time. Some of these projects have been in development since uh, 2017. This is the landing page for Cut, Copy, Paste, a monograph in develop from scholar Whitney Tredian. As you'll see here, um, there are different elements on this page, including a draft chapter, um, some a uh, copy about the project, and 
as we scroll down, you can see a hashtag that can be used for discussion of this book on Twitter. A Manifold project is made up of three core elements, text, media resources, and the commenting and annotation of readers. Texts are uploaded from an EPUB, a Markdown file, Word docs, or Google documents, and other formats, and those form the base layer within Manifold's reader. Each project has a section called resources, which I'll scroll down to here. You can see those here. Resources are made up of all the additive media not found in the base text file. In Professor Tredian's case, we have 124 media resources that have been broken up into these 12 collections. These resources include interactive scans of the book, some of them held at the Internet Archive, JPEGs, videos, spreadsheets, and links. When a reader scrolls down the page then, you can see that there is recent activity, and there's also a draft chapter that Professor Tredian has written and made available to readers uh, to read uh, as she's writing it on the site. This is the table of contents pulled from that file of the draft chapter that was uploaded. And when I go into the project, this is Manifold's reader. Uh, there are a few things to note about this. First of all, the site is fully responsive, so you can read it on your desktop, on your tablet, or on your phone, and it adapts to the size of the screen that you're reading on. Along the bottom of the page, you see this yellow bar. This text is called Draft Chapters. That text is customizable. In this case, it's a draft chapter, so that's what we've named it. You could also say preprint, version of record, final published text, or any customizable text that you want to draw attention to the reader about what they are reading at this time. Up at the top, you'll see that there is a menu bar with menu, table of contents, and um, the title of the section that you're reading. If you click on the table of contents, you'll see the full table of contents and be able to navigate as a reader to a different section if that's what you choose to do. As I scroll down, you can see that Manifold also can accommodate some of the resources within the text itself. And that is what you see here with, that are indicated by these um, squares within the text. This is a case where the author has annotated her own text with a resource. And if you click on that, you can go directly to the resource, see more about it, interact with it if it's interactive, then close it and come back into the reader and continue your reading experience. Lastly, you'll see some text highlighted or underlined within the project. This is reader interaction with a book. And it, what's really great is that you can turn that off and on with some navigation tools that we've enabled so that you can read your, only your comments and annotations, other people's comments and annotation, or none at all if you prefer that. It's worth noting that Professor Tredian has recently submitted her full manuscript for this project, and it's currently in peer review. We um, plan to publish this book in 2021, but we will also be able to continue to keep up the draft chapter and other materials that she's made available during this project's development so that the evolution of the project is always visible to the reader. Coming back over to my slide deck now. So from here, let me scroll through. Um, we have recently created a functionality called reading groups. Those reading groups were initially conceived for classroom needs, to create public and private groups for students and their instructors to comment and annotate within a shared environment. Today, reading groups can be made either public or private, and if they are private, they require an access code to get into the group. The individual who sets up the reading group controls these settings, and if it's private, they send a member an activation code and an invitation to join the group. We are developing a feature that will allow the reading group leader to add multiple texts, as you see here, into a project so that, uh, for instance, with a class, you can have several texts that a group is reading over time. Since the reading group feature was developed, we have also seen some non-course use, including some author events and interactions, and one Manifold publisher intends to sell tickets to author-led discussions of books. 
with it using the private reading group functionality. It will be very interesting to learn how successful that initiative is for them. At this time, we don't yet know. Creating private reading groups led us to create access controls on Manifold, requiring that readers have a token or a code to gain access to a group or to a text. This slide shows the backend interface of Manifold, where a publisher sets up a project. A setting allows access to be restricted to the project, that's right here, and it can be tied to payment or it could just simply be tied to an access code that you provide. Integration with a payment gateway is something that a publisher could do if they so chose. For instance, an instructor could pre create a private classroom edition of a public domain work and email the access code to their students, or a publisher could upload a project for peer review and email the access code only to the peer reviewers. We expect to see more uses of private reading groups now that we have this access restriction functionality enabled. This slide shows what the reader sees when a project is access restricted. When a reader clicked on the text, and you can see the icon that says text at the bottom of the screen, uh, they were shown this screen. It says that access to this project is restricted. And then there's secondary text in italics underneath that. That text is customizable. So for instance, a publisher could say, this access is granted to peer reviewers only or they could say to purchase access, please go to and then provide a link. I'll close my comments today by encouraging you to visit our website, manifoldapp.org, to learn more about using Manifold, to find us on Twitter at Manifold Scholar, or to visit our repository on GitHub at Manifold Scholar slash Manifold, where you can learn more about potentially using Manifold for your needs. Thank you very much, and I will switch back over. And next, we'll hear from Darcy Collins talking about Raven Space. Hello, I'm Darcy from UBC Press. UBC Press is a long standing publisher of Indigenous Studies, and with support from the Andrew Mellon Foundation and coordination of partners, including the University of Washington Press, we've recently launched a new model of publishing and platform for media rich interactive publications for this vibrant and interdisciplinary field. With Raven Space, we're trying to push the, beyond the limitations of print to support emerging forms of scholarship and community engagement. Our purpose is to bring the community relationships that are nurtured between researchers and communities into the entire publishing process, to provide a way to share Indigenous knowledges online in a way that respects how those knowledges have traditionally been held and shared, and to publish works for multiple communities of readers, academic, indigenous, educational, and public. The idea for Raven Space came as a response to the shift toward collaborative research where indigenous people and scholars were working together to design and pursue goals. Indigenous peoples outside academia actively participating and driving the research and contributing knowledge and expertise in activities that dovetailed with their own nation-based goals and activities. And often this collaboration would extend into the writing process with people working to produce a book manuscript, but when the manuscript came in-house, meaning that the book project was moving into the publishing phase, there were few supports for that collaborative process. And yet for communities, these collaborations lead to a range of practical ends, and it's important that the fruits of their research benefit not only academia, but also First Nations. We want to teach and share their knowledge, their, the results of that work with the next generation and inform non-Indigenous peoples about their cultures or bring their perspective to bear on issues. So we recognize the need for our publishing practices to adapt to a new kind of scholarship and the ethical and methodological considerations particular to working with Indigenous peoples and their cultural heritage. When publishing Indigenous content, we must also admit the limitations of copyright law and the different understandings of ownership, access, use, and sharing of that material. For example, a story can have a lineage of storytellers within customary laws rather than broader collective or individual owners of it. There's also a history of extracting artifacts and knowledge from First Peoples and an archival record that represents primarily the perspectives of the collector. 
with Ravenspace, we're providing tools that allow for greater contextualization of materials, streamed access to archival and media sources around the world to reconnect heritage and source communities, and that raise awareness about Indigenous protocols for interacting with heritage and intellectual property. With that in mind, Ravenspace aims to provide an alternative that encourages multi-authored works that through media brings the direct voices of elders and other community members into the work themselves, tightening the link between research, teaching, and cultural use, and that uses the tools of the web, such as metadata and tagging, to create relationships between content and context. We seek to improve reader engagement in multiple ways and encourage readers to navigate via multi-pathways, create visualizations, take deeper dives, or follow different paths um, that suit their own needs and give readers access to credible, peer-reviewed and community-approved content online um, from anywhere. The inaugural publication on the platform is As I Remember It. It presents the life story and teachings of Plum and Elder Elsie Paul, set in the broader context of cultural practice, Indigenous women's experiences, colonial and legal history in Canada. It's based on oral history methodologies. She worked with a, an historian and with her granddaughter in the production of interviews, which were transcribed and edited and served as the basis of the work. We actually produced a print book that was ordered in a life chronology and that privileged the text. So this digital publication is, in, is organized thematically. It restores Elsie's voice and audio. It adds depth of context, which makes for richly textured account and avenue for understanding Coast Salish life in the 20th century with the impacts of law and policy and social change. So I'm gonna switch over to my screen to show you examples of the live book. I believe you can see that. Yes, That's great. So the first thing a reader encounters, regardless of which page uh, they begin with, is protocol for being a respectful guest. It uh, presents the coastal nation's guest host welcome, where the host invites the guest ashore and takes care of them, and the guest agrees to be respectful of the customs there. So it signals to readers that there are different ways of interacting with different types of content online. This text is also reproduced within the publication and the broader questions actually discussed in an essay by one of the co-authors. So we'll agree and come ashore. So with this design, we've featured as an oral history, audio in the design elements, bringing that to the fore. So readers can hear Elsie. Um, clips are strewn throughout the book. We also have a video where she welcomes, greets the readers and explains the purpose of the work. For each of these, there are uh, metadata information. If you click on the citation, you'll be able to see the full set of metadata and also where this video appears in your book, if it's been reproduced or appeared in other paths. We also provide a linear reading, a non-linear reading, but also guided paths with choices to explore the work in different ways. The core path consists of Elsie's narrative of territory, colonialism, wellness, and community. There are then the paratexts as the authors call it, focusing on the slam language, which contains interactive linguistic analysis of the slam and traditional stories that are told. Our process, which describes the process of making the publication, includes editorial analysis, theory, and methodology. And the features and resources, where content has been repurposed to present in different ways for different audiences. It includes a media gallery, collecting the audio files and the video, so readers can browse through and choose to navigate that way. It includes map as a navigational tool, where readers can access parts of the book by choosing a place on the map. And also a curriculum explorer. This publication is mapped onto the K-12 curriculum 
and with interactive tool, teachers um, have a guide and educators can determine which parts are relevant for particular grades and subjects. Another feature is the traditional labels that we've incorporated into the platform itself. You'll see them here. These are tools for highlighting Indigenous understandings of ownership and access to cultural heritage and intellectual property and raising awareness about these different protocols and appropriate use. They were developed by Local Contexts, an initiative to support Indigenous communities in the management of their intellectual property and cultural heritage. The co-directors are Jane Anderson of NYU, Kim Christian of Washington State University, and Maui Hudson of the University of Waikato. I'll show you an example here. And we have the outreach label. These are standardized labels in their appearance and general purpose. And then they're customized by the authoring group in the community. So in this case, the outreach tool is described as you learn from someone by example. In contrast, we have the culturally sensitive material that is marked in this way. There's also non-commercial, and there's also attribution. These can be attached to any piece of media or to a page. I'd like to show you, I'll show you this feature. We also have notes for traditional notes, but also any piece of media, any piece of text can be annotated by another piece of media or another piece of text. So a painting, uh, an image, a piece of audio. So for translations or audio, uh, these can be embedded into the notes. We also have Indigenous languages to incorporate into the text. And not only can you author using the keyboard, you can also search using uh, the Indigenous keyboard keys. Here we have an example of the use of video and translation. And I'll show you that the map that we discussed. We've also chosen to use animation strategically in this work. There are some stories that either cannot be represented or told through video, or that are sensitive in nature and require a different kind of presentation for its readers. This also allows us to broaden the appeal uh, for uh, a wider audience. So I'll show you an example of the video, He Got His Spirit Back. There won't be audio here because of the format of this webinar, but this will show you an example of a story of resilience and traditional narrative. We worked with a production company called Lantern Films and their Indigenous illustrator to develop features that would be supportive of the goals of the Indigenous community and engage their audiences. We actually conducted uh, not only the peer review for this work, but community-based review in order to gather feedback on an early version of the work to understand what it is that they would need in order to use this in their own cultural programming and language classes. The use of visuals, the use of interactive components was very important to them to engage their students and to also be able to have multiple forms of expression represented in the work. So the oral part, the oral history traditions, the use of art, the use of images are incredibly important. And to be able to not privilege exclusively the text, but allow for a wide variety of forms has been central to this project. And to receive direction from the very users of this uh, has helped us to shape content and materials and work with different artists, different kinds of creators. And so it's also expanding the capabilities of the, the press of Raven Space uh, in terms of what publishing can be. So whereas we are familiar with copy editing techniques and indexing and proofreading and layout, now we're looking at 
about a different client presentation and bringing in videographers, video editors, animators, illustrators. And sometimes they will be working with the authors directly. Other times we work as a facilitator. And other times we work directly um, with and set the direction for those freelancers or vendors or partners. So we've worked in different kinds of arrangements in order to produce a wide range of, of works that can be incorporated uh, into the work. So as you can see, while there are these linear stories, uh, particular chapters and clear readings uh, through thematic themes, there are also different components and different ways that people can explore, dig deeper, and also what's very important is the connections between the content, the different kinds of relationships between archival juxtaposed with family photographs, map content, the idea of place and space being connected to stories and events, and that the record itself uh, of what these archival or contemporary or traditional forms of content, uh, how they can be used, who owns them, where they are found, and, and in we're doing that conforming with the standards of library practice, publishing practice, museum practice, bringing those together in order that these can, this additional contextual information can travel with the media and travel with the work. And thereby adding to and correcting in some cases, the institutional record. This is the first work in the collection and we're working with the University of Washington Press on a second work. Sarah, you'll be able to show that slide perhaps of uh, the website for both uh, ratingspacepublishing.org and from there linking into the first publication. Thank you, Darcy. And uh, now we'll hear from Allison Levy. Brown's initiative, which last fall received renewed support from the Mellon Foundation through 2025, establishes a university-based infrastructure to support the development, evaluation, and publication of born digital enhanced scholarly monographs. A collaboration between the university library and the dean of the faculty, the Digital Publications Initiative extends the university's mission of supporting and promoting innovative faculty scholarship while also helping to catalyze both the practice and recognition of digital scholarship in the humanities on campus and beyond. Having arrived at a model of developing long form multimodal digital scholarship, seeing growing interest in this effort on campus and finding that the publisher landscape is evolving in favor of these developments, Brown is on a path to developing a viable institutional approach to the creation and validation of new scholarly forms and helping to broker their dissemination through the most suitable venues for digital publication. Proposals are reviewed by a six member faculty advisory board with one to two new projects selected every year. Once a project comes into the initiative, the library's Center for Digital Scholarship works with authors throughout the process to ensure that their scholarly argument is suitably articulated and advanced. In my role as digital scholarship editor, I also represent the faculty authors to presses at disciplinary and industry conferences and work with presses on peer review, contract negotiation, dissemination, publicity, and scholarly recognition. Brown's initiative also supports a proctorship, an academic appointment for an advanced graduate student, which affords students an opportunity to gain skills and experience that position them for a broader range of academic career paths, such as digital humanities or scholarly publishing. We currently have six projects in our portfolio in the fields of history, Italian studies, Islamic studies, history of art, literary arts, and theater arts and performance studies. 
I'm going to, in a moment, turn this over to my colleague, Crystal Bruch, who is going to uh, walk you through uh, Furnace and Fugue, our pilot project, which has just been published by University of Virginia Press. And our second project, Italian Shadows, is forthcoming with Stanford in 2021. The pilot is co-edited by Professor of History, Tara Numadol, and independent scholar, uh, Donna B. Lapp, uh, shown there with me looking at uh, a printed 17th century book that inspired uh, this reconceptualization uh, of the early modern alchemical emblem book uh, for the digital environment. And so I will hand it over now to Crystal Bruch. Thank you, Allison. So again, my name is Crystal Bruch, and I'm going to walk you through the main features of Furnace and Fugue, then discuss some of our collaborative workflows. So while we are working on these digital publications, the question that we keep trying to keep in mind is how can we take advantage of the capabilities of the web to present and support this scholarship? The scholarly essays of Furnace and Fugue are one of the two main components of the project. So you can see them listed here. Now, some of the interactive features include this thoughtful animation that annotates the text as you scroll. Seen here, you can see the frontispiece and the characters described in this paragraph are revealed through the animation. And here we see some images moving in sync with the text as well. We also have inline notes, and that allows readers to stay on the main argument. It also provides them these avenues of exploration if they choose without bouncing them back and forth throughout the essay. And finally, we have these emblem collection spaces, which allow the authors to test their theories and uh, present their arguments and reinterpretations of the book. These collections are also available in our emblem collections drawer that appears throughout the site so that readers can expand on the author's collections and create their own and share them with other users. And the second main component of Furnace and Few is the visible edition. Seen here. Now, Atlanta Fugians is what the exhibit is based off of, and it's an emblem book that is multilingual. So we allow users to explore the various languages of the book. Here you'll see English and Latin. Some of the emblems also include German, and they're in different modes, to be normalized and put them on. So start with normalized English, switch to diplomatic, and here you'll see Latin as well. And again, the collection store will follow you throughout the project where you can reorder emblems, make new collections, and add to existing ones. As well as explore some metadata of the emblem images and cross reference them within the various collections. Another main feature of the book is taking the fugues that are part of each emblem set and making them interactive. So here, users are able to play various voices. Each fugue has three voices. You can turn them off to single out a few or a couple of voices. And we also allow readers to have a piano roll visualization, which can highlight some of the patterns that aren't obvious to non-musicians or to non-musicologists. So you can switch to a video of the interactive notation.
next I'll talk about the workflow among design development and editorial for the design process here you see us along Allison and I along with our um, external design studio studio rainwater we work together to handle the workload and there are three design layers before going to development first is research where we interview authors and stakeholders we determine and rank the audience and analyze similar scholarly projects and publications for our own inspiration as well as provide the authors um, with some ideas to help them grasp some of the capabilities of the web while they're writing. We we'll also do post readings of the essays and these group brainstorming sessions on how to illustrate the concept before authors might um, that authors might not totally envision when they start writing. So here you'll see a lot of wireframes on the table in the upper left corner. And in the lower right corner, you'll see some wireframes of the digital edition and some mock-ups as that furthers into development. So next we'll think through and sketch and confirm our ideas through wireframes. Moving on to the detail mock-ups and eventually interactive prototypes, it's an iter iterative process. And along the way, we get the best feedback once we get into that inter uh, interactive prototype position. So prototypes with Tara's class, we're basically using this class um, for user testing and we get some really great sort of insight from the students as they try and navigate the site. Uh, here, one of the things we learned is that the students wanted to zoom in to some of the images, which was not a feature we had built at the moment. So we later added that on that was really, really successful. And moving on to development here, you'll see the way we manage the project. Um, this is a Trello board, a snapshot of a Trello board, where we're sort of documenting all the things, the tasks that need to be done and the people responsible for accomplishing them. We also use a lot of the same design techniques to plan and coordinate among the developers as well. We'll do um, whiteboarding of directory structures and workflows to figure out people's needs. We also use Google Drive for file management and controlling access to various groups of people as we work through the project. And we work intensively in GitHub to coordinate between around seven or eight people. that are all working on different aspects of the project. Our strategy was to separate these groups into different repositories because, for example, someone working on the TEI might not need um, access to 10 gigabytes of images that someone working on the zoomable image viewer would need. And this got a little confusing at some point, but it also allowed for a lot of people to work on the projects with uh, relative speed and a really focused development environment. And eventually we used browser stock to emulate testing on various devices, on various uh, operating systems, various browsers, in order to test the responsive design as well as the cross-browser compatibility. So here's an example of our one of our GitHub repositories. And finally, the editorial process, specifically the workflow between the editors at University of Virginia Press and the various authors and teams at Brown. Um, that may have been the most informative experience for us. So for example, um, the authors and editors were both working in Word, but our site um, eventually became the master source. So that was actually in HTML and trying to figure out how to transfer between Word, HTML, back to Word, back to HTML. It was a, it was a process <laughs> it was interesting to figure out. And some of the other things that we had to figure out along the way was adding things like print CSS for proofreading, uh, working with Handoc for converting files from HTML to Markdown to Word for copy editing, and uh, using the Python package Beautiful Soup to help with um, extracting some of the footnotes as well. So that is the majority of our project. Um, some things that we learned in post production that I can leave with you um, as takeaways as to figure out your accessibility requirements at the beginning. Um, we decided to use the Web Content and Accessibility Guidelines 2.1 Level AA. Uh, that would also guarantee browser support for two years minimum. Those are our requirements. And let's see. You also want to define your goals for cross-browser compatibility in order to get to that two-year minimum for us. Um, that was something we have to figure out at the very beginning. And ultimately, working on digital publications is really exciting and compelling work. So I would suggest that people 
also build in time to share what they've learned and to celebrate your successes. So thank you. Thank you, Crystal, and thank you to all the panelists. We'd like to extend our sincere appreciation to SSP for giving us the opportunity to present, and we hope you'll all tune in next for our live discussion moderated by Beth Fugit. Thanks.